And I want to read some Scripture there uh, to you and bring you a message in the book of John, chapter 17. As I said earlier, you want to miss next Sunday. I'll be bringing the message on what the Bible says about alcohol. Strong drink. Uh, beer, wine, liquor, whiskey, rot gut. Uh, uh, Nyquil, all that stuff. John chapter 17. Amen. I know a guy got addicted to that. Using it for excuse to get drunk. So uh, you don't want to miss that now. Next Sunday, next Sunday morning, on what the Bible says about strong drink. Alright. John chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Now, I'm going to stop right there and let you know where we are here in the life of the Lord Jesus. He said, Lord, Father, I was born for this hour. I came into the world for this hour. He was 33 and some months years of age when He spoke these words. He said, of all these 34 year, 33 years, the hour is come. When it was two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight, He was preparing for this hour. The hour that He would bear the sins of the world on His body on the tree. On the cross, the Lord lived 33 and a half years. And now He said, the hour is come. I want to preach this morning on the subject, the final hour. The final hour finally came. As the Lord was getting ready to go through the agony and sufferings of the cross, He looked up to the Father and said, Father, the hour is come. No matter how much you dread something a day in your life, that day is going to come. No matter how much you look forward to something, that hour is going to come. For all of us in here this morning, the final hour will come. Let's think about that thought for a few minutes this morning. And I'd like to talk about the final hour of delay. The final hour of delay. You know, you can wait and wait and wait and wait and get by with it for a while, but the final hour finally does come. Every person who went to hell this week planned on being saved, no doubt. No doubt there are people in hell this morning who were in church last Sunday. They did not know that was their final hour. They didn't know it. They thought, well, tomorrow will be just like today. You know one of the biggest tricks the devil ever pulled on a generation is getting you to put off till tomorrow what you ought to do today. If you need to be saved, be saved today. If you need to walk down this aisle and get down and get right with God, get right with God today. Because the final hour of delay will finally come. They postponed. They procrastinated. They put it off until it was too late. A lot of people do that. You know, I read where that back years ago when they first started flying, they could fly a, a, a jet or an airplane at that time. And the first started going across the ocean. And when they first started going across the ocean, it wasn't like nowadays where they had enough fuel to go uh, halfway around the world. They could only have enough fuel to reach uh, from, from uh, Kennedy Air, Airport or wherever in, in New York over to London. That's all enough they had. And they said them pilots would fly, and they'd fly like this, and they'd go, and they'd go, and they'd go. And if they had any trouble or any problem... They said if they had any trouble, any problem, they could always turn around and come back. But he said once they passed a certain point, when they passed that one certain point out there, they couldn't go back. They didn't have enough gas. If they, had, if they passed that one point, all they could do was go on and hope they made it. And they call that the point of no return. And they crossed that point where they could never go back. And back was gun gone. And many people this morning, this, this day and time, have passed the point of no return. I've just passed the point where there's no way and no hope.
that they could come and make things right with God. It's, it's a shame today that they waited till the final hour of delay. Somehow or another, we know we're going to have to face God. Everybody in here knows you're going to have to face God one day, but you think, well, I'll put it off, and I'll put it off. You think how embarrassing it's going to be. Think how terrible it'll be one day when you stand before God and your whole life is up. I heard about this business years ago. A bunch of people owed them money and wouldn't pay it. And they put a sign up on the front of the business. It said, this business will be closed owing to bad debts. And he said, there's so many people who owes us money that won't pay it that we're going to go out of business. And they said, next week or time soon to come, a list of the people and the money that they owe will be posted on the door. And the money came rolling in. People started paying up. Now, they didn't want their name to be up there in public but that didn't pay their bill. And you know, people say, I don't want my... I've heard people say, I don't want my name to be in the paper where I didn't pay my taxes. Or I don't want my name to be in the paper where I had to go to court for that speeding ticket. Or, I don't, that's embarrassing. I don't want... Well, think about this. Think about God and the whole universe up there. And your name wrote there. And everything you've ever done in your life right there brought out. The Bible said every idle word that men shall speak. They shall give an account there all days of judgment. That's a scary time. Don't wait and make this the final hour of delay. Um, you need to think about it. man said to come this judge one time. He was a very successful, smart judge. Most of them judges are, are extremely intelligent, intellectually. And the judge wasn't saved, but his wife was, and she was sick. And the preacher came up to him. And he said, I heard you and your wife will be separating. He looked back at him and said, No. Who told you that? He said, I just heard you and her is going to be separated. He said, who told you me and my wife? Me and my wife said, I have no intention of separating her. And the preacher said, well, she has a, 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 a sickness. She's going to be dying soon. And she's going to heaven. They tell me you're not saved. And you'll be separated from her forever and ever and ever and ever. And boy, that's about that. And that legal mind got to thinking, he's right. I'll soon be separated from her and I'll never see her again. And he said, Oh God, have mercy on me. And the man got saved by the grace of God. You know something? He realized that it was his final hour. You know, people don't know when their final hour will be. If they did, it would make a lot of difference. I've said this many times preaching, and a lot of times, most times, it just runs off like water off a duck's back. But think about this. If every one of us in here today knew if we knew that this was our final hour, that we have until 12 o'clock uh, midday, did you know I couldn't even be preaching right now? This altar, people would be in this altar begging God to have mercy. You would be saying, Peter, I'm going to meet the Lord in a few minutes. I've got to get right. I gotta get my heart right. I gotta get saved or I gotta get myself straightened out if we knew it was our final hour. But I'm gonna tell you something, that final hour is coming. We don't know when, but the final hour of, uh, of, of pardon finally come. Not only that, the final hour of deception. Those that think they're okay with the Lord. There's many people today feel like they're okay with the Lord. When they executed Saddam Hussein the other day, it did. Uh, they they uh, may look like it anyway. They, they said uh, they put it on there, and boy, that old boy. They put him up there, and they said he was responsible for the death of a million people. And uh, the biggest part of the world was saying, "Yeah, let him get deserves." And they still hang them in, in, in Iraq. We used to do that here in this country, but don't anymore. And they they hung him to death by hanging. And they said the last thing he said was the last thing he said. They said before he went out into eternity, well, he said, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is His prophet. And I'm going to tell you, if that was his dying testimony, that was his final hour of deception. The devil had deceived him all these years and all these years and all these years since back in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And before he died, he said, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is His prophet. And he died and woke up in hell with the devil and the demons laughing at him. And he realized that was his final hour of deception. 
I'm going to tell you something. The devil's got millions of people deceived this morning. There's some people right here in Burke County that are just as deceived as Saddam Hussein. They don't believe Muhammad is God, but they believe just because their church has been going to heaven. They believe because they've been baptized, they're going to heaven. They say, well, I got saved when I was little and I'm going to heaven. And there was never no change. Jesus is not in their heart. Their sins has not been washed away. I'm telling you, the final hour of deception is soon coming. They told out a congressman we had this week. I didn't see this, but everybody was telling me about it. That they let a congressman swear in on the Koran. Did you hear about that? Uh, as to be a congressman in the United States. And I said, that's a shame and a disgrace. It's a shame to our nation, for one thing. Well, we ought to say, this is America. This is the way we do it. And if you're going to be a congressman here, you're going to do it our way. Amen? And the second deception is that man feels like that what's in that Koran is, is right. Those Muslims several times a day bow down and say, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is His prophet. Somebody saw a bumper sticker that said, God is too big for just one religion. And the popular thing is today, any religion is God as long as you believe in it. But I'm telling you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, they were seed. They were deceived. They are deceived. You say, well, how do you know? Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way, and Muhammad's another one. He said, I am the way. No man comes of the Father except by me. I mean, oh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and all that Muhammad Ali, that changed their name. Lord, have mercy. I'm telling you, that's awful myth. They think, well, that makes me real religious. That makes me real religious. And God is on my side. I'm telling you, they're deceived. It's a false God. There is a God besides Allah. Allah is no God. Allah is a false God. And Jehovah's God and Jesus is His Son. And the final hour of deception come upon them. You know, the thing now, them basketball players and all them saying, well, I'll grow up and I'll change my name and I'll get me a Muslim name and that'll be real religious and I'll go to heaven when I die and all that. Not necessarily, brother. Not necessarily. Um, I heard word that Buckwheat, bless his heart, Buckwheat on the little rascals grew up and become a worshiper of Allah. Don't talk, kid. Watch them, Jason. And they, they uh, became a worshiper of Allah. And brother, changed his name and everything to Kareem of Wheat. But I'm going to tell you something, brother. It don't get you no favor with God. It's okay. You can laugh. It's still a free country. We ain't got much left, but we got some. And I'm going to tell you something this morning, brother. They, he's, it's the hour of deception. It's the hour of deception. The Koran is not the Bible. Those that think God will ignore their sins are deceived. Those that think that uh, sincerity is enough will are deceived. Those that think I belong to church. I ask people, say, are you, are you saved? And they'll say, I've been, I belong to church all my life. They're deceived. The final hour of deception. Now, there are those this morning that would say, as long as a person's sincere, it really don't matter what they believe, just as long as they really believe something. Now, that's not, they don't think that's true in anything else. In math, there's absolutes. Two plus two is four. Four plus four is eight. If you were raised another way, it's wrong. In science, they're absolutes. In history, they're absolute. So when it comes to spiritual matters in church, there are absolutes. There's an absolute right. There's an absolute wrong. There's absolute truth and absolute error. That's why we believe the Bible is absolute truth. We don't believe it contains truth. We believe it is absolute truth. True. And so the Koran uh, is, is not enough. Sincerity is not enough. You've heard me tell that story of the house on fire many times. You young people listen. And this guy comes up and the firemen are outside and the woman's outside screaming, my baby, my baby, my baby's in there burning to death. And the young fireman puts on his gear, puts on his, on his thing over his head, his asbestos jacket, and he runs through the flames to rescue that baby. And he runs down the hallway. And the people are outside screaming, My baby! My baby! And he runs down the hallway, takes a blanket, wraps it up, holds it like this, and comes running out and hands it to them. And they're thanking him and hugging his neck, saying, Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! And brother, they open it up and it's a baby doll. And the real baby was burned to death in the house! He was sincere. There's nobody more sincere than that man was running to rescue that baby. But he was wrong. Now Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You don't go to heaven because you cried. 
You don't go to heaven because you turned over a new leaf. You don't go to heaven because you joined the church and decided to start doing better. You don't go to church or go to heaven because you've tried to quit your drinking. You don't go to heaven because you've been religious all your life. You must be born again. You must be born again. It's got to happen to you. You was born wrong the first time. You've got to be born again. The final hour of deception. Not only that, the final hour of deliverance. The final hour of deliverance is coming. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Boy, this old flesh that we've been in all these years will soon be delivered from it one day. The final hour of deliverance. I saw a wayward traveler in tattered garments clad and struggling up the mountain. It seemed that he was sad. His back was heavy laden. His strength was almost gone. But he shouted as he journeyed, Deliverance will come. It's coming one of these days, folks. We're going to be delivered from bondage. We're going to be delivered from sin. We'll never sin again when we get to heaven. We'll be delivered from sorrow. I was in the hospital this week myself. Boy, I, I tell you, it's different when you're in there yourself. I, I've been, I, I didn't have to stay but like three hours. I was about to die. I, I feel sorry for people who have to stay all night in one of them things. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I was in there. Uh, I tell you, they took me in there and... And uh, they, they stuck a needle in my arm right there and they started shooting stuff in me. I have no idea what it was. I was trusting them. It might have been LSD. Uh, uh, but I, but they, they was putting something in me. And, and, and you know, they said, now we're going to relax you, Mr. Castle. I said, you better, you better relax me because I'm about ready to jump off, off this bed and, and get out of here. And, uh, and, and, and I, I got to thinking about that. Thinking about all them times. I was talking to Miss Sue. And she said, now, Brother Danny, just trust the Lord. That's what I always tell people. Just trust the Lord. Just trust the Lord. It's easy to say when I'm visiting them and I feel good and they're laying there sick. But boy, when it's you, just trust the Lord. I'm scared. Uh, uh, But let me tell you something, brother. I got to thinking about all them people. It's it's Diane, Jennifer's mother's over there in the hospital this morning in Asheville. I got to thinking about the people who have been in hospitals for weeks and weeks and months, some of them years, and never get up. I've got good news for you. The hour of deliverance, thank God, is coming one of these days. We're going to get a brand new body. Amen. They said they was going to put... I'm I'm standing right now on leg with no ACL ligament in it. I don't have a ligament in it. don't have a cartilage. They tore it out and threw it away. And uh, I'm standing on it right now. And uh, they said, now we can cut one off you or we can take one out of a dead person or something. I said, I don't want one out of a dead person, but I'll take Michael Jordan's. I'll get him. Man, if they put wins in me, I'd really be doing it. Uh, but but I, I tell you, I, I got to think about all the people that our bodies, our bodies, Stuff happens to them, and and you get sick, and 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 sickness comes, and and you and and things. Finally, ain't you glad the final hour of deliverance is coming? No more jails, no more broken hearts and broken dreams, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering. Aren't you glad we're going to a place one of these days where we'll never have a problem? I mean, think about it. Think about it, folks. The final hour is coming when we'll be delivered. Hallelujah. The final hour of deliverance. But I'm going to say lastly this morning, the final hour of regret. The final hour of regret. Jesus, three hours in agony on on the cross, and so He said, the final hour is come. God pulled down the curtain, literally. I heard about a preacher. And this preacher was driving down the road one day, and he come around a curve like this right down near where Florida and Alabama meet down at the bottom near near Mobile, Pensacola, in that area. And he's driving down this road and he come down the road and there was a dirt it's on a dirt road and there was a little pull off down here near the river. And all these young teenage boys would get down there and think they had their 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 uh pickup trucks and they was out there drinking and and uh, and he said he was driving down the road he said he's driving down the road. And he said the Spirit of God spoke to his heart and said, go over there and witness to them boys. And uh, immediately he started thinking, well, Lord, I can't. It's, Lord, I'm, I'm busy. And Lord, they're, all, they're drinking and it's just not a good time. And he went on down the road. And the Lord said, go witness to them. Be quiet now, girl. Listen. And he said, Lord, I tell you what I'll do. I'll go back and find out where they live. And I'll go to their house and witness to them. It just don't seem like a good time. And he, and, he, and he quenched the Spirit of God. You know how when the Lord's dealing with you to do something, 
and the Lord lays it on your heart to do it, and then the devil will give you a thousand reasons why you shouldn't. Speak to that person. Well, no, no, they're working. Well, no, they're busy. And the devil's trying to talk you out of it. And he let the devil talk him out of it. He went home. And he said he went home and been home about 30 minutes. About 30 minutes, his telephone rang and somebody said, Get up here. I said, Preacher, get up here. Something terrible's happened. And he jumped in his truck and went up there. And, and he got up there and he said he saw crowds of people and lights flashing uh, ambulances and police cars. He said there was one of them trucks, them boys was driving off in the ditch, turned up sideways. And he said there stood all them young men weeping, crying their eyes out. And he said in the middle of the road laid look what looked like a human body with a sheet over it. And he said those boys had come out of that hole when he didn't stop and talk to them. He said let's drag race. And they was all about half drunk. And he said, there's drag racing them old trucks up that dirt road and they come around that curve. And an elderly woman was just going out to get the mail. Got out there in the middle of the road and she couldn't get out of the way. And them trucks come around and slid and run over and killed that woman. And she was laying there in the road. And he said, their final hour had come. And there stood them boys. It's regret time. No time to change your mind. Preacher, can't go back with it. All you young people, listen to me this morning. You can go out and party. You can go out and live it up. And you may think, I'm getting away with it. I'm getting by. Nobody knows. But the final hour is going to come for you. This boy was in trouble on drugs. Messing with drugs, alcohol. It's always a mistake. Always a mistake. Always a mistake. It's never, ever the right thing to do. And he wanted to go to a concert. Mama wouldn't let him. She said, you're not getting the car keys. You're not going to that concert. And you know how when you're young, you get full of the devil. And you say, my mother and my daddy make me so mad because they won't let you go do all the wicked things that you want to do. And you get mad and blame them for it. And you're the one full of the devil. And buddy, I'll tell you what. they That boy looked at him and he said, I'm going to go no matter what. And he said, he's laying on his bed listening to his headphones, had headphones stuck in his ear. And he had these headphones stuck in his ears and he's listening to music and the music, something spoke to him. Listen to me now. And his music spoke to him and said, just kill your mother. And the influence of that drug and the demonic influence through the music. He went and got a fake pistol out of the top drawer of his, of his daddy's dresser drawer and took it in there, and his mother was sitting in a chair and put the gun to the back of her head and shot his own mother. And went in there and put the gun back up and called the police and told them what he'd done. That was that spirit that came on him that caused him to do that. And it's a demonic spirit that causes young people to turn on their parents like that. They took him in jail and they put him in that little room to... Uh, they're going to arraign him there for a few minutes and, 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 and interrogate him and question him for what he was done. And the detective was in there with him and they were starting to ask him questions and that spirit left him. And when the spirit left him, he said, what's going on here? And they said, you just shot your mother. He said, no, 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 I couldn't have shot my mother. He got into his right mind. See, that demonic spirit influenced him to do that thing. And then he got in his right mind and he started screaming and they called the preacher and, they call, and the preacher started running down the hall and he said he could hear that young man screaming in that jail cell saying, no, no, I couldn't have done this. I couldn't have done Not my mama! Not my mama! I love my mama! And the preacher got in there and he said, preacher, can't we go back? Can't we go back? Can't we go back? Just a little while ago, I, I, I killed my mother. Preacher, no. And the preacher said, no, it's over. It's done. You're going to have to live with it. I'm telling you, the final hour of regret come. The final hour of regret. You listen to me? That's why George Whitfield said, you take care of your life. God take care of your death. You take care of your life, God will take care of your death. There's never a wrong time to do the right thing. You say, preacher, I feel like you're talking right to me. Somebody said the other day, they said, man, I come to church and I felt like He's talking right to me. And I was preaching what God laid on my heart. And whoever it is this morning, you need to do business with God. 
You need to start off the new year right. You've done been slipping. You said you'd never slip, but you're already slipping. You said you'd never miss church, and you're missing. You said you was going to read the Bible, and you don't even read it. You said you was going to live for God. And you're just living in sin and going, the final hour is coming, my friend. I want to tell you something, and I'm through. You know, there's a man by the name of George Wilson in 1829. He is convicted of robbery of the, of the United States mail and sentenced to hang him. We hung him in this country in 1829. And three weeks before he was to hang him, President Andrew Jackson reviewed his case and issued a pardon. And Andrew Jackson signed it and said, Take it to him. George Wilson has been pardoned. He can be a free man. They took it to him. An oddly bizarre thing happened. He refused his pardon. He said, I don't want to live. I don't want the president's pardon. He can go jump in the lake with it. I'm going to die and get it over with. And George Wilson refused the pardon from the President of the United States. And they, 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 they reviewed it. It had never happened before. And it's on record, the United States versus George Wilson, the Peters Report, page 150. The court reviewed it and they took it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said this. They said, a pardon is not complete without being accepted. And they said, we can't force a man to accept a pardon. Without it, the pardon's no good, and the court has no power to force it on him. George Wilson hung, and he could have went a free man, and the pardon was no good because he refused it. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your pardon, but a pardon is no good unless you accept it. God has no power to force it on you. You either accept or reject it. Now, I'm going to tell everybody here something this morning. and We're getting ready to sing. Come on, Miss Desi. Come on, Brother Jason. I'm going to tell you something this morning. You listen to me. The Lord Jesus Christ stands here this morning ready to forgive you of anything you've done. And He loves you and wants to help you. But it does you absolutely no good if you won't come and accept it. If you're here this morning you've never been saved, by the grace of God, the hour is come. The final hour. The time for you to come. If you're here this morning, you're a Christian. You've not been living like you should and you want to start off the new year right. You say, preacher, every time I start doing good, I fall and I mess up. Well, that's the way everybody's like that. You might want to say this morning, I'm going to start anew and afresh. 